healthy 10-year-old boy is found dead on his bedroom floor. It was so sad. Oh, my goodness, how could this happen? But as questions multiply, it quickly turns into a case unlike any Dr. G has ever faced. It's really opened my eyes. I just can't forget it. Then, a young girl is struck by lightning and tragically does not survive. And then the doctor is telling me, this is it. You know, um, I'm sorry, Mrs. Chappelle. Erica's no longer with us. And suddenly, Dr. G must make a potentially life-saving decision. That's one of the calls we get in the middle of the night. If you deny those organs, you know, people may die. Altered lives, baffling medical mysteries, shocking revelations. These are the everyday cases of Dr. G, medical examiner. As chief medical examiner of the District 9 Morgan Orlando, Dr. Jan Garavaglia's days are usually jam-packed. This is gonna be a mess. But if there's one thing she'll always make time for, it's consultations with fellow medical examiners, like her good friend, Norma Jean Farley. And it's face down, and it's a strangulation. Dr. Farley and I practice in different states, but oftentimes when either one of us wants to bounce off ideas about a case, we'll just both pick up the phone and uh, drop what we're doing and talk to each other. We, we think very much alike. I really value her judgment, and uh, she's an excellent pathologist. They first met in the 1990s at the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office in San Antonio, Texas. Back then, Dr. Farley was a pathology fellow working under Dr. G's guidance. During the fellowship, uh, Dr. G was one of my mentors. I would often consult Dr. G about cases that I may have had in the morgue, any questions or anything I wasn't sure about. And in the winter of 1999, Dr. Farley sought Dr. G's advice on a case that seemed impossible to crack. Little did either know, it would soon become one of the most confounding and emotionally charged cases of both pathologists' careers. I was just involved somewhat peripherally, uh, but I just can't forget it. It was a child, and it was so sad, uh, and so unexpected that uh, it's just never left me. September 1999. Danny Evans is 10 years old and living with his parents in San Antonio, Texas. Like a lot of kids his age, he loves sports and video games, but he also has a passion for music. In fact, he spent much of the past summer teaching himself to play electric guitar. This is a happy, happy-go-lucky child with a nice family. But as the school year gets underway, parents Katie and Tom begin to notice a troubling change in Danny's behavior. He wasn't his normal self. He was a little too hyper, and he was having a hard time in school sitting still, focusing and concentrating. Determined to get a better handle on the problem, Danny's parents arrange for a consultation with his pediatrician. What they discover next changes their lives forever. They finally got him diagnosed, and he had ADHD, uh, attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder. There's certainly different uh, gradations of that, but it's basically that uh, these children have a hard time focusing and concentrating and uh, are very uh, hyperactive. The doctor prescribes Ritalin, a drug commonly used to treat ADHD. The effect on Danny is dramatic. He was finally given the proper medication and I mean, he reached his potential. He was just a go-getter, always adventurous, um, and from my understanding, he wanted to be a doctor, and they were just so excited. He went from a special ed kid to a gifted and talented student. So the family was very happy about his progress with uh, the medication that he was taking. But their happiness is short-lived. Only three months after his diagnosis, 
the unthinkable happens. It's a chilly Monday morning, and Danny's running late for school, again. His parents assume he's overslept as usual. But stepping into his bedroom, Katie is startled to find Danny crumpled on the floor. He wasn't breathing, and he was cold to the touch. They immediately called 911. Paramedics arrive within minutes, but they only confirm Katie and Tom's worst fear. They did try CPR, because with children, we want to try so hard, you know, to resuscitate them and bring them back. But it was unsuccessful. No, I'm sorry, I don't have an address. Medical investigator Steve Hansen, who is also working in Texas at the time, moves quickly to gather as much information as possible about Danny. This was a tragedy. And I mean, everybody was upset about this. Here's a kid that's, that should be OK. And he died basically a sudden, unexpected death. He was 10 years old when he died. And that's a very uncommon age to come into the morgue. Danny's case promises to be tough. But when his body arrives at the morgue, Dr. Farley, on a one-year fellowship at the time, volunteers to do the autopsy. As a fellow, I always try to be in on the most difficult and interesting cases. Now, as she pours over Danny's medical history, one detail catches her eye. Looking at the investigative report, I saw the child was taking Ritalin or methylphenidate for his ADHD. Both Ritalin and its generic version, methylphenidate, are widely used and considered very safe. As she continues reading Danny's medical history, she discovers an alarming piece of information. The child had asthma. Asthma is a chronic, lifelong lung disease. Uh, usually, a person can live with the chronic part of the disease. They may have some coughing. But when they have an acute asthma attack, then that's when it becomes life-threatening. The airways constrict, and they get inflamed, and you, you have a hard time breathing. It can kill you, especially if you don't have a fast-acting inhaler near you at the time of your asthma attack. But Dr. Farley must also explore the ultimate tragic scenario that Danny's untimely death involved no disease at all. You know, we have a child that's dead, and the sad truth of it is, child abuse is still present in our society. Even the happiest family might be hiding dark secrets. And in our field, we really know this. As a mother of three children herself, Dr. Farley understands all too well that the stakes are high and the answers may be grim. But I don't let my emotions get in the way. In the end, the family has to be held accountable if we find something. All right, Crystal. I think we're ready to go. We look very closely at the outside of the body. We look for any injuries to the body at that point, and we also look for scars. We're going to look for subtle marks, because those marks might help us uh, determine how he was hit on what he was hit with. Is there anything that can give us a clue of what happened? But soon, a subtle injury catches Dr. Farley's eye. A small blue contusion here on the right chest, right at the nipple. OK, about 1.5 centimeters. I wasn't very worried about it. This was a very small contusion, and it really wasn't suggestive of any foul play. That could just be from cardiopulmonary resuscitation, where they had EKG pads. Looks like they gave him quite a bit of fluids when they were trying to resuscitate him. Hmm. No other injuries noted to the abdomen or chest. But after scouring Danny's body for any hint of injury, Dr. Farley comes up empty-handed. 
he looks like a well-developed, well-nourished 10-year-old, and the external really didn't give us any hints. Still, if there's one thing Dr. G and her team know, it's that physical abuse can leave surprisingly little evidence. I will tell you that I've worked many cases where there is not a, a mark on the child, and until the autopsy is done, you don't know that the physical trauma is there. Everybody ready? We must rule out uh, child abuse. We must rule out that something happened to this child. At the Bear County Morgue in Texas, forensic pathology fellow Dr. Norma Jean Farley is determined to find out what or who killed 10-year-old Danny Evans. The police investigating this mysterious surroundings of the death started suspecting the parents, which were the last people to have seen them. The parents were in a state of shock couldn't even believe that there were actual suspects in this, you know, the death of their son. It was a nightmare for them. But when it comes to the unexpected death of a child, the forensic team has no choice but to explore even the darkest scenarios. The worst thing we can do is to assume things. We ask what seem to be an awful lot of stupid, basic questions. But, but they turn out not to be, because these are the basic questions that we, we really need to ask. You really have to finish the internal examination to rule out foul play. I've been fooled before. So we start with a Y-shaped incision, which comes across the chest in a V, and then a single line down to the pelvic region. I'm going to make it few cuts in the soft tissue. Just make sure there's no contusions that we're not seeing. Little bruises that might be hiding. But I didn't see any soft tissue injury at all in this child. There's no blood in any of the cavities. There's no rib fractures that we can see. So right now, I'm not seeing anything that worries me that this is trauma. To completely rule out foul play as a cause of death, Dr. Farley still needs to examine Danny's head for injuries to his skull and brain. But for now, she continues her inspection of his internal organs, looking for any sign of natural disease. I want to stay focused on the organs of the chest, and I was very anxious to do this because I wanted to take a look at the lungs, hmm. since one of the main clinical clues was the fact that this child had asthma. Upon opening the chest plate, Dr. Farley gets her first good look at Danny's lungs. Really, these, these lungs are deeper than the chest cavity. Uh, they feel like they're a little bit heavy, but um, they're not overexpanded at all. Not what we typically would expect in a, an acute asthma attack. So maybe the fact that they were doing CPR, they pushed some of that air out of the lungs. If that's the case, asthma still may be the culprit. To find out, she now extracts the lungs to examine Danny's bronchi, the airway passages that extend through the organ. With asthma, you produce an overabundance of mucus. You get a lot of mucus uh, mixed with in some eosinophils or inflammatory cells, and they plug up all those bronchi. So you can see that they weren't able to exchange air. She dissects the organ, inspecting every slice for mucus plugs that could have robbed him of oxygen. But the search is difficult. Oh, well, the uh, bronchi do care. They have a little bit of uh, green-tinged mucus, and that's pretty much all I found. Hmm. There really wasn't a lot. There was a little mucus there, but it wasn't like there was a plug of mucus. Again, I had to remember, though, this child had CPR. And so could some of that mucus been moved out of these smaller airways during the time they were trying to resuscitate him? So basically, we can't rule in or rule out asthma at this point. What I'm going to have to do is take microscopic sections of the lungs and multiple sections in different areas and see if I can prove this acute asthma 
by the microscopic examination of the tissue. Keep a little bit of this. So maybe microscopics will give us something on this one. Dr. Farley prepares the lung samples to send out to a lab where they'll be chemically treated, mounted onto slides, and stained for her examination. But the process will take at least a week. In the meantime, she still has a long way to go on Danny's autopsy. And next up is the heart. The heart looks normal within the sack. Doesn't look too big. Just to make sure, I'm gonna go ahead and take the heart out and make sure that there's no anomalies to the heart or the great vessels. Carefully, she removes Danny's heart from his chest cavity. And as she turns the organ over in her hand, she makes a discovery that's completely unexpected. Mm. There were some small contusions, little tiny bruises, or areas of hemorrhage on the surface of the heart. Could be the cause of death in this child. The baffling case of Danny Evans is putting Dr. Farley to the test. So far, she's uncovered two possible causes of death, an acute asthma attack and foul play. But now, as she inspects the heart, she finds evidence of a third possible killer. Well, you know, right here on the front of the heart, there are scattered little contusions here. some tiny ones there, like a myocarditis. Myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart itself, the tissue in the heart. And it's usually caused by some type of infection, especially a viral type infection. And so this inflammatory process actually injures and starts eating away at the heart and can result in fatal cardiac arrhythmias. That could definitely uh, cause death in a kid this age. The symptoms of myocarditis can resemble the flu, with fatigue, fever, and a sore throat. Oddly, this fits with a minor detail in Danny's medical history. About two weeks before his death, he was diagnosed with a case of the flu. But if myocarditis is the true culprit, she can only prove it under the microscope. So I typically put five pieces in different locations. One more from here. All right. These samples will go to the lab along with Danny's lung tissue and return as microscopic slides in several days. Only then can Dr. Farley determine if the young boy died of asthma, myocarditis, or even something else. But the autopsy is still not over. She has one place left to look for evidence of foul play. Danny's head. We start this, of course, by reflecting the scalp and looking again for any soft tissue hemorrhages that may not have made it to the skin surface. And there weren't any. We also look at the skull itself. All right. No skull fractures. You can see the suture lines because this is a child and his head's still growing. So they're all open, but no fractures at all. Totally clean. And there's no blood here. So there's no signs of any kind of trauma. I continued and we removed the brain as well. And I didn't see any abnormalities to the brain. Uh, there was no evidence of any type of meningitis or inflammation to the membrane around the brain. The brain is totally normal at this point. We're not finding anything unusual. With the cranial exam complete, the entire autopsy comes to a close. And looking back, only one thing is clear to Dr. Farley. I have now totally ruled out foul play, which I will relate to the investigative officer on the case.
But for Danny's parents, being proved innocent of child abuse is small relief compared to the agony of losing their only son. They were just in a state of confusion. They wanted to find out what happened. I was hoping with the microscopic examination, I would be able to give the family some type of answer, some type of closure. A long week after Danny's autopsy, Dr. Farley gets the microscopic slides back from the lab. So I do have two possibilities at this point, asthma, or it may be some type of inflammatory process in the heart itself that caused a fatal abnormal arrhythmia that caused the child to die. Okay. I began by looking at the heart and looking for the inflammation that I was hoping would be there and improve myocarditis. And I didn't see this. Hmm. The heart looked totally healthy and normal. Dr. Farley now knows that myocarditis did not cause his death. She immediately looks at another slide, this time of Danny's lung tissue. Mostly what I'm looking for is increased numbers of white blood cells, especially eosinophils, which is a type of white blood cell that we often see and associate with asthma. Asthma is similar to allergies in that an attack triggers a flood of inflammatory white blood cells. If Danny died from an acute asthma attack, she would find a large number of inflammatory cells, specifically eosinophils, saturating his lung tissue. Slowly, she turns the dial, bringing every cell into sharp focus. And I did see some inflammation, mild to moderate, chronic inflammatory cells. Danny Evans clearly had asthma, but Dr. Farley isn't certain if her findings prove he suffered a fatal asthma attack. I then went through the other tissues, looked at the liver, looked at the kidney, looked at the adrenal glands, the pancreas, I didn't see anything wrong with any of those tissues. I then went to the brain and looked at the brain, thinking, you know, maybe I didn't see a subtle meningitis, but there was nothing wrong with the sections of the brain either. So after the microscopic examinations, I'm still at a dead end. I may never have the answers for this boy's family. I just dictated this case. Could you download it for me and let me know when it gets back, okay? Sure. Thanks. At the Bear County Morgue in Texas, Dr. Farley has hit a brick wall in her search for what killed 10-year-old Danny Evans. After the microscopic examinations, I still don't have a cause of death in this child. Weighing heavily on her mind are Danny's parents, Katie and Tom, whose anguish is growing each day as they wait for answers. They just couldn't take the pressure. It was, it was an emotional strain on them, just unbelievable proportions. For their sake, and as a professional, giving up is not an option. Only twice since I've been a forensic pathologist, I've had to say a death was undetermined, and I really don't like to do that. She did find hints of asthma in Danny's lung tissue, which leaves the possibility, however slim, that asthma caused his death. But as Dr. G's pathology fellow, she knows when it's time to get a second expert opinion. So at this point, I decided to go up to Dr. G's office and have her just quickly take a look at the slides, and in particularly the lung slides, and just make sure I wasn't missing anything in my diagnosis. At the time of this case, she's clearly the fellow. Uh, I'm clearly the staff, and I have to uh, help teach her. But it was more than that, because we had hit it off. I think we just had a mutual like of each other. And uh, whenever she had a question, um, she, she would she'd often come to me. With Dr. G, it, I always felt comfortable that I wasn't uh, interrupting something. She always made time to discuss the cases with me. She was kind of on the, on the fence whether it was enough asthma or not because she really wanted to 
give the family the answer. Uh, it was getting close to Christmas. She really wanted to just put this to rest and have some closure for the family. Now, Dr. G carefully scans Danny's lung tissue for inflammatory cells and diffuse bronchial plugging, which indicate an acute asthma attack. I really wanted her to be able to find the acute asthma I didn't see on those slides. But when I looked at the slides, there wasn't. Uh, there wasn't near enough acute changes. So unfortunately, I had a tattler that she just did not have enough on that slide under the microscope uh, to say that's his cause of death. He, he, clearly, his cause of death was not asthma. Dr. G's analysis yeah. is a huge blow to Dr. Farley. And she's beginning to fear she may never find closure for Danny's parents. And I'm wondering where else I can go. But then, Dr. G offers one last ray of hope. What she told me was, Norma, wait for the toxicology. It could have all the answers. The chances are extremely small, but there is the slight possibility that a large overdose of Ritalin could have triggered a fatal arrhythmia, a cause of death that would have been impossible to detect in autopsy. Unfortunately, Toxicology at that time took about three months to come back. So it meant that the family was going to have to wait before I'd have that result. It was hard on the family. They were just overwhelmed with the whole process. I mean, the mother was in really bad shape. But we want the right answer, not the fast answer. I just want to give them some type of closure. So now I'm even more anxious to get these toxicology results back. A grueling month goes by, followed by another. Finally, on a cloudy Friday afternoon in March, the toxicology report on Danny Evans arrives. Finally, I get the toxicology results, and I, I'm very anxious to see if there's anything that could help me determine a cause of death. And I'm expecting to see Ritalin, because the child is on this for the attention deficit hyperactive disorder. But when the tox came back, it was a surprise to us all. It was a shock. At the Bear County Morgan, Texas, a bombshell has just been dropped on the case of 10-year-old Danny Evans. This was a child with ADHD who was on Ritalin. And so I'm expecting to see Ritalin in these toxicology results. But when we got the tox back, it was a shock because the toxicology showed no Ritalin whatsoever. Instead, I find a drug I'm not even expecting. I'm finding the drug methadone. Methadone is a powerful central nervous system depressant, a synthetic drug strictly monitored by the FDA. It's almost inconceivable that the 10-year-old would have access to it because the drug's primary use is to treat heroin addiction and chronic severe pain. But Dr. Farley is startled to find he not only had methadone in his system, he'd ingested a huge amount. The methadone level in this child, it was 0.44 milligrams per liter. That's not only lethal in a child, but that's lethal in an adult. So at this point, I do have a cause of death. It's an acute methadone intoxication. Her discovery sends shockwaves through the morgue and immediately sparks a barrage of questions. How did he get the methadone? What could possibly be the ways this child could have gotten methadone? And is he trading uh, his Ritalin, which is a stimulant, for the methadone, which is more of a down or a depressant? You know, it's it's certainly be methadone is certainly becoming a very common drug of abuse, but we mostly see it in teenagers. I've never seen it in in one so young. Ten years old is pretty young to be using methadone as a drug of abuse, but. Maybe he didn't know what he was trading his uh, Ritalin for. Or is there someone in the family, the mother or the father, uh, may be on the medication? 
Dr. Farley and Dr. G call the entire investigative team back into action, launching an exhaustive search for the origin of the dangerous pills that killed Danny. All of a sudden, get a call saying, we need to go back and we need to find out why this kid had methadone. Go back to the family and see if anybody in the family was on methadone. And there was no one. Go back to the school and see what kind of student was this child. Was he drug seeking in any way? But he's not the type of kid. Everybody at school is baffled um, and his family's baffled. Nobody seems to know. So then I started thinking, where else would he get methadone? Well, you know, one of the things we finally thought about is, well, how about those pills that he is supposed to be taking? Has anybody checked those? Danny's bottle of prescribed Ritalin had been brought to the morgue with his body and left untouched ever since. Looking at the label on the bottle, I noticed right away that the name is correct. But instead of Ritalin, which is what I was told he was on, which is a brand name, he was on the generic, and the generic was methylphenidate. Ritalin and methylphenidate, both drugs are identical, and it's common for doctors to allow a brand name prescription to be filled with the cheaper generic counterpart. But in this case, Dr. Farley has a strong hunch that the seemingly benign switch triggered a deadly mix-up. If she's right, she'll be able to close the three-month-old case for good and replay for Danny's parents the exact chain of events that led to his tragic death. It's 6 p.m. on a Tuesday. Time for Danny to take his evening dose of Ritalin. Over the past few months, the medication has transformed his struggle with ADHD. After being properly diagnosed and given the proper medication, he went from being in special ed classes to being an honor roll student, a gifted and talented little boy. His parents, Katie and Tom, couldn't be happier. But recently, they've been dealing with an entirely new health concern. He was not himself, he was always drowsy, and he would start getting the cold sweats. Alarmed by these new and perplexing symptoms, they take Danny to the doctor. He reassures them that it's only the flu. But the diagnosis couldn't be more wrong. Unbeknownst to anyone, Danny is actually feeling the effects of a powerful narcotic, methadone. And Dr. Farley thinks she knows how it got into his system she immediately heads to the poison control office with the contents of the pill bottle. I pass the pill over to uh, the poison control, and within about 15 minutes, they were able to tell me what the medication was, and it was methadone. The methadone had been filled, most likely incorrectly, at the pharmacy. I could see how it might happen, methylphenidate, methadone, both M's maybe sitting by each other on the shelf, and inadvertently, you pick up the wrong one and you fill it in the prescription bottle. When they refilled his prescription three weeks before he died, they had switched it from the brand name to the generic of methylphenidate, and the person who filled that prescription inadvertently gave him methadone instead of methylphenidate. Now, the family didn't pick up on the fact that it was a different appearing pill because they just thought, well, this is the generic, is a different shape pill, a different color pill, as it often is. And the depressant effect of methadone started almost immediately. He's drowsy. They can't wake him up. He seems always tired. The symptoms grow worse each day because methadone has what's known as a long half-life. And basically a half-life just means the time it takes to get half of the drug that you've ingested out of your system. So the more he takes, the more methadone he's accumulating in his system. Frightened by his worsening condition, Danny's parents rush him to the ER. But again, an opportunity to identify this tragic mistake falls through the cracks. And they even do a urine drug screen. But most likely, the urine drug screen that they performed uh, only looked for five or six different medications. It's totally different in forensics. 
The drug tests we do are confirmatory and they're the gold standard and they're done in your blood. The drug screen that you get in an emergency room is very limited. It's only designed to pick up the common drugs of abuse. And methadone has to be looked at and asked for specifically. And in this case, the, the drug screen panel did not pick up methadone. In the meantime, Katie and Tom continue to follow the advice of Danny's doctor, cutting the medication to half the original dose. But, you know, he's been on methadone now almost a month. So it's accumulating in his system this whole time. And on this night, it becomes too much for his small body and he has too high of a level of methadone. He's breathing slower and slower until he stops breathing and dies. Dr. Farley has put together almost all the pieces, except one. She calls the Texas State Board of Pharmacies to confirm this tragic chain of events. Methadone and methylphenidate are both uh, controlled substances, so we kind of keep a good eye on them. In fact, they do counts on this type of medication to make sure no one's abusing the medications. In this case, we did find out that they were short on the methadone, the exact number that they prescribed to this child. So it was clearly a pharmacy error. Although they didn't do it on purpose, they mixed up the name of methadone and methylphenidate. Just a, just a really bad, unfortunate circumstance. Nobody wanted this to happen. The state board issues a fine and suspension, and the case is settled out of court with the family. But to the pharmacist, it isn't about the money. Oh, it's sad. You know, the, it was just a small mom and pop type of pharmacy. They'd been in business for, you know, 40 years. And he was devastated that his business caused the death of this child. He was grieving just like the, you know, the family was grieving. And he lost his business. He, he sold it. For Danny's parents, the wounds cut even deeper. Although the family was angry that these mistakes were made, the pharmacy mix-up, the fact that it wasn't picked up on the drug screen, the fact that no doctor could figure out what was going on, ultimately, they were very upset that what caused his death was what they were giving him to take. It was through their hands that what they gave him caused his death. Each one of those pills had been cut in half just as the parents were told to. They were following the directions given to them by the doctor. They wanted to do right. And by continually giving those pills that they thought he needed, they were killing him. The impact of Danny's death runs deep for both Dr. G and Dr. Farley. This is one of those cases you walk away from and you take with you the rest of your life. When my children get prescriptions now, or my husband or myself, I actually do look at the pills. I usually do it on every medication that we get in the family for, just because of this case. I've been a medical examiner for over 20 years. I've worked on thousands of cases, we're in well over 6,000. Why this case stands out, why this case is one that I can't forget is that it was a surprising ending to me and a tragic involvement of the mother who loved him so much. I'm a mom and you want to do nothing but good for your children. The loss of a child is always tragic. But Dr. G's next case gives her an opportunity to turn tragedy into hope. It's a beautiful case of a tragedy that this family was able to turn around into something very positive for other people. In her career as a medical examiner, Dr. G encounters astonishing stories every day. Wow. 
Wow. And many of these stories stay with her forever. This case actually very much stands out in my memory because, you know, this shows you how our lives turn on a dime and how precious life is, how fast it can be taken away from us. It's August 25th, 2004, and fourth grader Erica Chappelle is on her way home from school. Erica Chappelle is just a healthy, beautiful 10-year-old girl that was having an ordinary day. Her mother, Bianca, still remembers the rainy afternoon as if it were yesterday. Erica and three other children had gotten off of the school bus. And my daughter, Erica, was taller than the rest of the kids in her class. And so she asked them, could she hold the umbrella and everybody come under the umbrella with her? They heard a crack. She directly got struck by lightning. Rescue workers arrive just minutes later to find that Erica has no pulse and is not breathing. CPR had done on her for about 20 minutes before her heart rate returns, uh, but unfortunately during that time, her brain wasn't getting enough oxygen. When Erica arrives at the hospital, she's in a coma. Her chances of survival are slim, but doctors refuse to give up hope. They were trying to regulate her vitals and, and figure out how, where we were gonna go from there. Really didn't have a lot of answers other than keeping her stable, um, monitoring her heartbeat and her respiratory and all of that. Hours pass. Then a day. Then two. Still, Erica shows no sign of improvement. To see your child in that kind of state and feel so helpless, you know, not knowing what I was, what the outcome, I just didn't really know how to act, other than the fact that I knew I needed to be strong for Erica and I needed to be strong for my family. On the third day was when they came to us and said, we have a test that we have to run on her. And after that, we'll be able to tell you whether or not she's brain dead. It was on um, August the 28th when the doctor ran the last test. And then the doctor is telling me, this is it. You know, um, I'm sorry, Mrs. Chappelle. Erica's no longer with us. Devastated at their loss, Bianca Chappelle and her husband are now confronted with one of the biggest decisions of their lives. They came to us um, within probably 30 minutes of her passing, and they told me her organs could be donated. That part was hard, but my husband and I, at that moment, together, looked at each other and went, yeah. We think that that is going to be a wonderful legacy to her, to save someone else's life. But before Erica's organs can be donated, the organ procurement agency must get approval from one more person, Dr. G. They have to call my office uh, because she is an unnatural death. It's a traumatic death, uh, an accidental death, and I have to investigate that death. She must decide if she can perform a successful investigation without many of Erica's vital organs. It's an urgent situation and every second counts. With Erica's case, uh, we have to make a quick decision so they can quickly get her into an operating room and recover the organs before they're uh, damaged any further. She quickly runs through all the information she has hospital records, police reports, and accounts from her medical investigators. There didn't seem to be any question about why she died. 
it was witnessed, she'd already had a CAT scan of her brain. So there was really no questions left. Dr. G is always eager to help save a life by facilitating organ donation. Occasionally, we have to put restrictions on it. We may not let them open up the chest, let's say, because that's where the injuries are. Um, we may not want them uh, to open up the abdominal cavity. A couple times I've had to restrict them for not taking the heart for heart valves and restrict them not to take the skin because I need to look at the bruises. So I will occasionally have to put restrictions on them if it looks like there's foul play involved that I am still trying to figure out what happened. This time, the decision is easy. Once the hospital gets the official sign off from Dr. G, the usable organs and tissues are removed from Erica's body and she's transferred to the District 9 morgue. She has an incision all the way down her chest and her abdomen, which they made to get her organs out. But when I see her, she's still a beautiful uh, young girl. Pretty dark brown eyes. She still has clear injuries and burns from the uh, lightning. 46. And as she anticipated, Dr. G is able to quickly confirm Erica's cause of death. It's clear she was a victim of a lightning injury. The way people die from lightning is usually an electrical event. It harms the nervous system. And guess what keeps your heart pumping? It's that electrical uh, component of the heart. And so when that um, electricity sp splash comes over you, uh, it can stop your heart. It was a cardiac arrest, and her uh, brain didn't get enough oxygen. Dr. G's brief autopsy is now complete. She records the cause of death as cardiac arrest as a result of lightning strike. But Erica's story is far from over. They were able to use um, kid, uh, kidneys, um, liver, um, that the valves of her heart were able to be used, that the corneas of her eyes were able to be used. So she saved three lives. We got a letter from a 17-year-old girl who lives in Tallahassee who said that um, she had received um, Erica's kidney and if she had not gotten Erica's kidney, she would have died. And she told us that she loved us and that she was my daughter because she had a part of my daughter in her. And that just really, really, it, it, it made it all worth the while. Erica was a person who I know all through her life loved people. She always had the attitude where she wanted to help. So that's basically what keeps me going. To this day, the strength of the Chappelle family is a continuous source of inspiration for Dr. G. You know, donating organs of a loved one is a very personal decision. And it takes a really special family uh, really special people uh, to turn their own grief and tragedy around to try to help somebody else. Though you're desperate to believe, he